time to start. Um, could I have the second question sheet by Friday? OK, if you can just uh, send me the second question sheet. And you know, don't bother to scan things in. You can just put uh, a hard copy in my uh, mailbox, OK? OK, so today I'm going to start on the crystallography of Martin-Sedic transformations. And before I go on to doing it quantitatively, I need to introduce uh, the qualitative theory for Martin's side. Some of you may have seen this before, the first part of this lecture. But bear with me, because it's important to get that part right before we go into some equations, OK? So I'll just go through, quickly go through some characteristics of Martin's side, because we need to understand them in order to uh, properly do the theory of Martin side. Uh, the sort of things that you're familiar with is that you know there is a particular temperature where Martin side begins, and that's called the Martin side start temperature. Okay? And you'll be familiar with the fact that Martin side happens in many materials, not just steel, although it is most important in steel. So for example, here there's a cornea, there's a, a solidified gas, argon nitrogen solid solution, and these are the Martin side start temperatures. So the Martin side start temperature can be very low, or it can be very high depending on systems uh, that you're dealing with. And similarly, the hardness can also be low or high. It depends on what your material is. If you have a large carbon concentration, then the hardness will tend to be high. But if you have an alloy which is free from carbon, even if it's made of iron, then it will be a soft martensite. For example, the maraging steels, when you quench them, they're soft martensite. So martensite does not have to be hard, and it does not have to form at low temperatures, but it can form at low temperatures, which means that you know, it can grow without any diffusion. <clears throat> so martensite can form at very low temperatures. And it can grow extremely rapidly at the speed of sound in the metal, which can be of the order of 5,000 meters per second. And there is no composition change during transformation. If you chemically analyze the martensite side before, uh, if you chemically analyze the austenite, and then you analyze the martensite, side, they are of exactly the same composition, no matter how fine the resolution of your analysis. In other words, if you do, for example, an atom probe experiment, and look at compositions at the interface, there will be no change. Okay? So it is a diffusionless transformation, which means that the change in crystal structure must be achieved by a deformation of the parent phase. Yeah? It also means that for the interface to be able to move rapidly, it must have special characteristics. That means it must be able to move without any diffusion. The shape of martensite uh, in three dimensions is like a plate. Okay, so if, if I did serial sectioning of this, or if I looked at the plate on two different surfaces at the same time, then I would see it as a plate-like object. And the plates are quite thin. The usual aspect ratio is of the order of 0.05. That means the thickness divided by length is of the order of 0.05. And when people talk about martensite as needles, that isn't correct. Because look, any micrograph that you look at, you do not see round sections. Okay? And if they're needles, then the largest probability is of seeing round or elliptical sections rather than long objects. Okay? So what is the meaning of a laugh of martensite? So we know what a plate of martensite is. What is a laugh? What is the shape of a laugh? Yeah, plate is like a plate that we eat on. You know, it's, it's got two large dimensions and one small dimension. What about a laugh? Yeah, yeah, you, you've got a good idea. Yeah, you were, you were motioning. Okay, so what do you think is a laugh? Plate. Plate. Uh, no, not really a plate. You know, it, it's like this that it's long in one dimension, it's quite long in the other, and then thin. So it's a bit like a ruler, you know. OK, so that's a large shape. So, but nevertheless, when you section it, you will not see round sections. There, there are flat faces on that, OK?
Now, the reason why it's a plate shape is, is fairly straightforward, that if I take a single crystal of austenite here, and I allow it to form martensite just surrounded by air, then the shape will change in this manner. Okay? And this will be quite a fat plate, because it's, it's not pushing against anything. There's no strain energy involved here. But if I form the martensite under exactly the same circumstances, but sub surrounded by many other crystals, you know, then there's a lot of strain energy, because you can see this deformation is large. And if it has to push against many things, then it, it will adopt the shape of a thin plate. And qualitatively, that's very easy to see, because look, if, if this is my austenite and I form some martensite, okay, uh, let me redraw that. If I form martensite from it, then the displacement here is larger than the displacement here, even though the shear strain is identical everywhere. Right? Shear strain is this divided by this. But the displacement gets larger and larger as I go away from this invariant plane, right? So if I make my object as a thin plate, then effectively at the tip the displacement is zero. Yeah? So that is why you favor the formation of a thin plate shape, purely to minimize elastic strain energy. That interface plane here is the same as the average plane for this plate, and it's called the habit plane, the plane on which the martensite forms. And the strange thing about that is that it's an irrational plane. That means although I've written habit plane indices here, they are not exact. I can't actually express them as integers. Okay, so, so the square root of 2, for example, is irrational. It goes on forever, right? 1.4, 1.414, and so on. So these are approximate habit plane indices. And even the approximate habit plane indices are strange, you know, like 3, 10, 15, or 2, 5, 9, and so on. So you have to ask yourself the question, why does martensite choose to form on these very strange habit planes? Okay, and that's one of the things we have to explain using the crystallographic theory of martensite. Why doesn't it form on a nice 111 plane or a 110 plane? Why does it form on these strange habit planes? Okay? And of course, uh, the habit plane varies also with the chemical composition. Why does it do that? Now, we talked about the kerjimo sachs orientation when we were doing the coordinate transformation matrices. And the kerjimo sachs orientation means that the 111 plane of austenite is exactly parallel to the 011 of ferrite. And the close back direction in the 111 plane, which is the 110 direction in austenite, is exactly parallel to the 111 direction in the ferrite. Okay? So that's called the kerjimo sachs orientation. There's also the nishiyama wasserman orientation, uh, in which if I take this here, and I rotate it by 5.26 degrees, then I get a more symmetrical orientation. Okay? But it's very similar. And in the literature, you'll find others like Greninger, Troiano, and so forth. They're all approximately 111 plane parallel to 011 of ferrite and 111 direction of austenite parallel to 10 bar 1. But when we measure the orientation accurately, it's not Kojimo Sachs, it's not Nishiyama Wasserman, and the close back planes are not exactly parallel. The actual orientation relationship is irrational. Again, there's a, there's a very small angle, or something of the order of half a degree, between the close back planes. Now, why, why do we have a strange orientation which is irrational instead of having something nice and neat like this? Okay? So that's another feature of martensite which is strange. Strange habit planes, odd orientation relationships. <coughs> Yeah, this, this is just uh, showing you there are many other variants of this, all of which are quite similar, reported in the literature. But to measure this exactly is quite difficult, okay? And, and you can't do that using 
ordinary electron diffraction or EBSD and so on. So when you read papers saying, you know, you've got a Kerjimov Sachs orientation, that's not really correct. Yeah? We'll show that this, uh, the exact orientation relationship is impossible. Okay? Um, we discussed in a previous lecture how to create an interface. We, we took a, a single crystal and we cut it in half and tilted the two halves by the angle theta. And then we found that there was a hole left there, the, a hole left in the form of a wedge. And we filled that up with what? Dislocations. Edge dislocations, because an edge dislocation is like a thin wedge. Okay, so this really is the structure of an interface. Uh, and it's in terms of an array of dislocations of a certain spacing, and the spacing and the Burgers vector of the dislocation determines the relative misorientation. Now, I could have created this interface differently, okay? Uh, I could have twisted the two crystals, for example, or I could have used a combination of twist and tilt and so forth. But the reason why I've taken this interface is that this is like a low angle boundary, and it's a very special low angle boundary. It's a low angle tilt boundary, such that the Burgers vectors are not in the plane of the interface. Okay. Now, what that means is that that interface can glide just like an ordinary dislocation can glide. Okay? And glide, by glide, I mean it does not require diffusion to move. Okay? just as an ordinary dislocation doesn't require diffusion to move. So this is what we call a glissile interface. Okay? And when this interface moves, you will change the shape here. This, this part will change to this part. It's exactly like the shear deformation. Okay? So you can see that even a tilt boundary, when it moves, will cause a deformation. Okay? So this is, this is a glissile interface because the Burgers vectors of the dislocations are not in the plane of the boundary, so it can move without diffusion, just like an ordinary dislocation. Yeah? On the other hand, this is a sessile boundary. Here, the extra half planes are oriented uh, such that the Burgers vector is in the plane of the boundary. That means that for this interface to move, the dislocations would have to climb. Yeah, everyone knows what climb means, right? Yeah. So uh, if you have a dislocation with an extra half plane and it has to move onto a different plane, then you would have to get rid of some material. And that getting rid of happens by diffusion. So this kind of an interface cannot possibly represent Martensitic transformations because we know they can happen at temperatures as low as 4 Kelvin and at 5,000 meters per second. Okay, so diffusion is inconceivable in those circumstances, right? So the fundamental condition for Martensitic transformations is that you must have a glissile interface. And this applies also to bainite and to Wiedemann staten ferrite, all of which are plate-shaped in steels. Yeah? Now, there is one, one further complication, is that if I don't just have a, a sort of a simple tilt boundary, okay, I, I'm, I'm not talking about phase transformation as yet, because to get phase transformation, you need partial dislocations, okay? But the point is that the boundary that I've drawn is a simple tilt boundary, and I've tilted about one axis, right, out of the plane of the board. Uh, let me just go back. Yeah, so the tilt direction is this way, okay? But I could actually also tilt uh, about two different axes, right? That would mean that I would have two sets of dislocations in the interface, yeah? Now let's just see what that means in terms of whether that's a sessile interface or whether that's a glissile interface, if you have two sets of dislocations in the interface, okay? Now, if you've got two sets of dislocations, then when they move, they will interfere with each other. Okay? And that is illustrated on this slide. Um, I've got a dislocation with that as the line vector and that as the Burgers vector. And this is a, a screw dislocation 
This is the line vector and this is the Burgers vector, parallel to the line vector, right? Now, what would happen when this cuts this dislocation? Well, if we, if we focus on, on this screw dislocation, we've introduced a step when this dislocation cuts through it because you know that you know if I have a dislocation going through a crystal then it will create a step on the surface when it leaves the crystal right and that step is like this step here so when this dislocation cuts this one, it leaves a step which is equal to the Burgers vector B1. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? And of course, when this dislocation cuts this one, it will leave a step here which is the same as B2. So the character of this dislocation has changed. It's no longer a screw. This has an edge component. And therefore, it may not be able to glide freely because the slip plane of this edge component might be different from the slip plane of the screw component. So the problem is that if you have two sets of dislocations in the boundary, then you will render the boundary sessile. So a most important condition for a martensite austenite interface is that you cannot have more than one set of dislocations in the boundary. Right? And those dislocations uh, will lie along an invariant line. That means a fully coherent line between the austenite and the martensite. Because if it is not fully coherent, you'll need another set of dislocations to accommodate the mismatch along that line. Is everybody clear about that? So a glissile interface cannot contain more than one set of dislocations. And martensitic transformation is only possible if the deformation which leaves the parent, uh, which changes the parent into the product, leaves one line undistorted and unrotated. That means an invariant line, a fully coherent line between the austenite and martensite. And such a deformation is called an invariant line strain because it leaves a line unrotated and undistorted. So tomorrow, if somebody asks you, you know, can I get martensitic transformation in uranium, right? From body-centered tetragonal to monoclinic. Can I get that transformation? If you cannot find a fully coherent line between those two crystals, then martensitic transformation is not possible. Okay? So this is quite a fundamental condition for any martensitic transformation. Okay? So the minimum a condition for a deformation which changes austenite into martensite is that it must be an invariant line strain. It can, of course, be an invariant plane strain, which leaves a plane unchanged. Okay? Because a plane is an infinite number of invariant lines, right? So if I'm looking at the interface in the plane of the board and I see a set of dislocations, then that will be where the invariant line is. Because then I do not need another set of dislocations to accommodate the misfit along this line. Okay? So that ensures that you have a single set of dislocations, the existence of this invariant line. This makes the interface between austenite and martensite a low energy interface because it's, it's, there's quite a lot of coherency along one line. Yeah? So if you look, uh, if you compare interface energies, uh, this is the austenite martensite interface energy per unit area. This is for a mechanical twin, okay, so quite low, an incoherent boundary, and the surface energy of window glass. So it's, there's a lot of coherency in the martensite austenite interface. Now, the most important feature of martensite is that when you polish a surface of austenite completely flat and you allow it to transform into martensite, the surface will be tilted. 
right? That's the deformation accompanying the formation of martensite. So this is a sample of austenite, which was polished completely flat and allowed to transform into martensite. And the colors represent the angle of tilt. Okay? So you can see that the surface is completely changed, and it's not an etched sample. So the deformation due to martensite is a real deformation. You can see it physically. It can do work. Uh, and that's exactly what you do in the case of uh, your trip steels and so forth. Yeah. And we've already seen uh, this, this kind of a diagram that this is an invariant plane strain. It leaves this plane unchanged, unrotated, undistorted. But it only causes a volume change. This is like slip or mechanical twinning where we only have a shear deformation. If you combine the two, that is the kind of deformation we get with martensitic transformations, where you have a shear strain and also a volume change. Okay? And typical values of the shear strain and the volume change are here. These are very large. Yeah? Uh, an elastic deformation is of the order of 10 to the minus 3, whereas these are 0 0.26, 0 0.03. So it's a large deformation. Now. You should be noticing something, that the shape deformation is an invariant plane strain. And the minimum condition for martensitic transformation is an invariant line strain. Okay. So does that imply that we can change austenite into martensite by a deformation which is an invariant plane strain? We, we have to think about that a bit more. Okay. So, But the shape deformation, when you observe it experimentally, is definitely an invariant plane strain. That means it leaves a plane undistorted and unrotated. OK. This is basically what I drew on the board, that you can describe this shape deformation in terms of arrays of dislocations moving on a microscopic scale. And on a macroscopic scale of observation, that looks like a homogeneous deformation. And that deformation leads to a lot of strain energy. This is a shear strain and the volume change, the shear modulus of the austenite, and the thickness to length ratio. And the form of this equation is easy to understand, because if you plot a stress versus strain graph, stress versus strain graph, elastic, OK, then it's a straight line, because it follows uh, Hooke's law. And the area under this curve is equal to half sigma epsilon, which is the same as half times the modulus squared, epsilon squared. Okay? So you've got the strains squared, and you've got the elastic modulus of the austenite. This part is much more difficult to derive. Yeah? You need Ashelby's theory for that. Uh, but it has been done. And what it shows is that if the thickness becomes small relative to the length, then you minimize the strain energy per unit volume. But of course, if you make the thickness too small, then you don't get any transformation. So we want to achieve transformation, but we want to keep the thickness to length ratio as small as possible. Okay? So these transformations are dominated by strain energy. And if you ignore the strain energy, you simply won't get the correct interpretation of the structure and the properties. Right, now I've emphasized to you that we have strange habit planes, you know, close to 3, 10, 15, but not exactly 3, 10, 15, and even 3, 10, 15 is a strange habit plane. We also have irrational orientation relationships, and we have a shape deformation, which is an invariant plane strain. And I'm going to show you that it's impossible to change austenite into martensite by a deformation which is an invariant plane strain. Okay? And Greninger and Troiano, around 1940, showed that if you take the shape deformation, which we see experimentally, and you apply it to austenite, it will not produce martensite. Okay? So there's something very wrong here, that the shape deformation is inconsistent with the internal crystallography of austenite and martensite. We haven't proved that as yet, but we will do shortly. So these are major difficulties, which were very hard to understand. 
Okay, so let's look at the crystal structures of martensite and of austenite. That's austenite and that's martensite. Uh, I haven't drawn in all the face-centered atoms, just for clarity. And the way in which we can deform one into the other is, you know, if I put two austenite cells next to each other, I can draw a body-centered tetragonal cell of austenite. Okay, so this is a BCT cell of austenite. And if I compress along here and expand uniformly along here, I get my body-centered uh, cubic cell of martensite. Yeah. Now, this can also be body-centered tetragonal if we have carbon atoms ordered on one set of axes. But that's, that's uh, a minor modification. Okay. So we know how to deform austenite into martensite. And you can imagine other kinds of deformations which would take FCC into BCC. But a huge amount of work has shown that this Bain strain is actually the lowest energy configuration for changing gamma into alpha. Okay. Right, now we can prove that it's impossible to accomplish that change by a deformation which is an invariant uh, plane strain. So we are representing the austenite as a sphere, and as a consequence of the Bain strain, it will be squashed into a, an ellipsoid of revolution about the z-axis. Okay, so here we've got a contraction, and along the x and the y-axis, we've got an expansion. And I can find two lines here, which are unchanged in length by the deformation. But they are rotated. Therefore, they are not invariant lines. Yeah? An invariant line is undistorted and unrotated. So the Bain strain on its own doesn't even produce the minimum condition for martensitic transformations. That means we must be able to find one line completely coherent between the two lattices. If I add a rigid body rotation here, then I recover one invariant line. But there is no way that I can recover two. Yeah, because as I rotate it, this goes further away. Okay. So it's impossible to change austenite into martensite by a shear deformation, an invariant plane strain. And yet, that is the shape deformation that we experimentally observe. Okay. So something is not right. Notice one thing is that I could have rotated in the opposite direction and recovered this as the invariant line. Okay? So there are two solutions here. So, um, sorry, I should have explained that that extra rigid body rotation completely explains the observed irrational orientation relationship. Okay, so we'll calculate that in the next lecture. So we've solved the problem of the orientation relationship because we know that we need a small rotation after the Bain strain to produce the invariant line and therefore we get the irrational orientation relationship. But the shape deformation is inconsistent with the Bain strain and we still haven't explained the other features of the crystallography. So I'm going to summarize the difficulties so far, okay? And I'll start with a shape of austenite which looks strange, but it's a single crystal of austenite. Here. This is my starting shape of austenite, okay? So when it transforms, uh, you will get a deformation which is an invariant plane strain, okay? So if, if I shear this on this plane, then it will change into a, a square. So that's the observed shape deformation. There, there's been a, a shear deformation on this plane. It's not exactly a shear. There's a volume change as well. Okay? It's an invariant plane strain. So that is the shape that I observe. But that doesn't produce the right crystal structure because an IPS, invariant plane strain, cannot deform austenite into martensite. Everyone clear so far? So this is an inconsistency. And this is the observed shape deformation. In order to get the right crystal structure, the strain has to be an invariant line strain. Okay? Now, we've got an invariant plane strain. What do I have to add to, get an in, to make the total deformation an invariant line strain? So I've got, I've got 
this kind of a deformation. I need to add something to make the total deformation an invariant line strain. Is there any way I can combine the first invariant plane strain with another invariant plane strain so that the net deformation is an invariant line strain? You know, imagine that I've got a shear happening on this plane, right? Then it leaves every line on that plane unchanged, right? If I've got another shear happening on this plane, then every line on this plane is unchanged. So if I have both of them, there's just one line unchanged by both deformations, right? So the combination of two invariant plane strains is an invariant line strain. Everyone happy with that? So if I add another invariant plane strain, Then I get the correct crystal structure, but the wrong shape, because we don't see this experimentally. Right? And can you tell me where the invariant line is? Hmm? On X. Yeah, the passing through X, like this. Yeah? Because this is the plane on which this shear happened, and this is the plane on which this happened, and the intersection of those two planes gives me the invariant line. OK? So we haven't solved the problem. You know, we've got the correct crystal structure, but the shape is not correct. So we need to do something more. We need to correct that shape without changing the crystal structure. What kind of deformation can be used to correct the shape without changing the crystal structure? Slip or twinning. Slip or twinning. Because, you know, when you, when you take ordinary steel and you deform it, you're not changing the crystal structure, you're just changing the shape by slip, usually. But you can also get mechanical twinning, for example, in the twip steels. So, if I inhomogeneously deform this so that I periodically twin the crystal, then, mechanic, uh, then the macroscopic shape here is the same as this, and I haven't changed the crystal structure, Twinning doesn't change the crystal structure. It simply orients it differently. Okay? So that would give me the correct crystal structure and the correct shape. Alternatively, I could periodically slip the crystal. All right? So I, I, I've got the slip steps here. And again, I've got the correct macroscopic shape and the correct crystal structure. Now notice that this is not a homogeneous deformation we're doing. It's happening on certain spacing planes. And that's why you see this straight line is now kinked. Remember I defined a homogeneous deformation as leaving points which are collinear remain collinear. All right? Well, that's, that's not the case here. Okay? Now what you should see in a transmission electron microscope is, is twins, finely spaced twins, or slip steps. Yeah? And this explains why the habit plane is strange. Because supposing this is a 111 of austenite, then the average here could be anything. Yeah? And similarly here. So absolutely everything is explained. Yeah. Not only that, you predict the existence of structure inside the martensite. And that you can see when you do microscopy. Yeah, so you see either the slip steps or the twins. And here is a transmission electron micrograph showing a beautifully twinned plate of Martin size. So this is the habit plane. You can see it's 3, 15, 10 roughly. Okay? And these are twins inside the plate of Martin side. So these were predicted before they were observed, yeah, which is quite rare. So, this theory completely explains every crystallographic feature of martensite. Yeah? So given lattice parameters and a bit of imagination, you can work out the habit plane, the orientation, and the shape deformation systematically. Okay? And furthermore, those three quantities are mathematically connected. Yeah? So if you look at a different habit plane, you'll get a different shape deformation and a different orientation relationship. So what we are going to do is to express all that mathematically. Right? And in today's lecture, what we'll do is find 
the deformation, which is the Bain strain and the rigid body rotation. So that's the total transformation strain. Okay. Is everyone happy with the crystallographic theory? 1953 by Bowles and McKenzie and Wexler, Lieberman and Reed. Okay, still, still going strong. Okay, so uh, here's that diagram again. And this is my austenite. This is the observed shape deformation. And this is the second invariant plane strain, which converts the total into the Bain strain and the rigid body rotation, which is an invariant line strain. Okay? So P times Q equals JB. And this is an invariant line strain. And then this is the lattice invariant deformation because it doesn't change the crystal structure, it just changes the shape. Now P here is the normal to this plane. Okay? In other words, the habit plane. And D is the displacement direction of that invariant plane strain. Okay? So if, if you remember, we drew this slightly differently. This is D and this is P. Okay? Q is this plane here the invariant plane for the second deformation, right? And the displacement direction of, of this invariant plane strain is hard to draw because it's not in the plane of the board, right? So uh, the displacement direction of, of this invariant plane strain is actually out of the plane of the board, okay? So what we are going to do is calculate this today and then we'll progress with the rest of it in the next lecture. <clears throat> okay, this is just to repeat what I've said, is that if I start with austenite and I have two, two invariant plane strains, okay, in this case it's happening on the plane with normal P and in the direction D, and in this case on the plane with normal Q and in the direction E, then the combination of these will leave the line going out of the board an invariant line. Okay? There's one more thing you should realize, and on this diagram I've deliberately drawn E on the same plane here, but in general E will not lie in the same plane as P, D, and Q. Okay? But just to illustrate the point, um, all the displacements for this are parallel to E. And all the displacements for this are parallel to D. Okay? So if I, if I look at the planes parallel to the board, then although those planes are distorted yeah, by the displacements parallel to E and parallel to D, yeah, you can see this plane is distorted, right? The spacing of those planes cannot be changed. The spacing or the orientation of those planes cannot be changed, right? Yeah. The planes parallel to this board, they remain in the same orientation and their spacing is not changed. They are deformed. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Because all the displacements are parallel to the board. Therefore, the spacings cannot be changed, right? So there will also be an invariant normal. In other words, there are a set of planes whose direction is not changed and whose spacing is not changed. But there will be distortion within the plane, so it's not an invariant plane. Okay? So for an invariant line strain, you're able to find an invariant line and an invariant normal. Everybody happy with that? Okay, the invariant line in this case is poking out of the plane of the board. Yeah. And it happens to be the case with the diagram I've drawn, that the invariant normal is also poking out of the plane of the board. But if E does not lie in this plane, then that would not be true. Okay? So with an invariant line strain, you're able to find an invariant line, obviously, and one invariant normal. Okay?
Right, so a familiar matrix, the Bain strain, with uh, uniform expansions in the x and y plane and a contraction in the z direction. And I've defined this basis f, which is an orthonormal basis. That means all the basis vectors are of equal length and 90 degrees to each other and parallel to the cell edges of austenite. Making it orthonormal simplifies some operations that we are going to do later. Yeah? So orthonormal means the basis vectors are all unit vectors. OK? Now, this, these distortions contain information about the lattice parameters, the A alpha, A gamma. Okay? So if you change your lattice parameters by alloying, then you will alter the crystallography. OK? Right, we have to, in order to proceed with the calculation, we have to make an assumption about which sys system will this lattice invariant deformation happen on. Yeah? You, you, you can choose many different planes and directions in which the slip direction is a lattice vector always, okay? and the slip plane is a rational plane. For example, 111 plane, 101 direction, or 10 bar 1 direction and so on. You don't know from the beginning which will be the most efficient way of cancelling out the effect of this, right? But if you choose the wrong one, then you will get the shear strain as very large. So you use some criterion to decide which will be the system on which you will get slip or twinning. Okay? So let's let's take a guess for that, all right? So we will assume that, and I'm going to refer everything to the austenite, all right? Uh, we will assume that the lattice invariant deformation happens on the 101 plane of the austenite and in the 10 bar 1 direction of the austenite, okay? And this is our invariant line, the vector u, which has components u1, u2, and u3. And since the invariant line must lie in the plane of the two lattice invariant deformations, yeah, because you know it's, this is one plane, this is another, that line must lie in the same plane as both of those invariant plane strains, right? Since this must lie in this plane, we already have u1 equal to minus u3. Uh, yeah, OK? because then you get a dot product which is zero, right? So we don't know what u is, but we know that u1 must be equal to minus u3. And we've chosen it to be a unit vector, right? So its components squared, sum of the components squared is one. Now, have you noticed something here? That normally we should write this as u f star times f u to get the magnitude squared, right? But since it's an orthonormal basis, we don't need to do that. Yep. A star is the same as A. OK? So you know, if I take the sum of the squares of these quantities, I get the magnitude squared, right? U1 squared plus U2 squared plus U3 squared by Pythagoras. OK? So we've already got some conditions for the vector U that it must lie in this plane of the lattice invariant deformation. And therefore, U1 must be equal to minus U3. And the magnitude is defined to be 1. We simply want to find the orientation of the invariant line. The deformation there is 0 anyway. Yeah. You know, it's an invariant line. Therefore, there's no distortion. OK. When the Bain strain operates on u, it will create a new vector x. OK? So the vector u is deformed into the vector x. And the vector x has this magnitude here in the same way. And if I write x f as, as a Bain strain times the vector u, OK? I'm writing fx as Bain strain times the vector u. And similarly, this one as u times the transpose of that. OK? Because this is the transpose of this, isn't it? A row is a transpose of a column. So I've got here this part and here this part. 
And this is a symmetrical matrix, so that just becomes a square. OK, what are we trying to prove? Yes. Uh, so now how does that give me the magnitude of u equal to the magnitude of x? Let's, let's work it out, OK? <laughs> OK, so FPF is equal to eta 1, eta 2, eta 3. And FPF squared is equal to uh, the transpose of this is the same, isn't it? Row by column. So it's, it's basically eta 1 squared, eta 2 squared, eta 3 squared. Yeah, the magnitude is identical simply because uh, it's an invariant line. All right, we are trying to discover the invariant line, therefore, this must be equal to this. Which means that the magnitude of u, which is u1 squared, u2 squared, u3 squared, yeah, must be equal to this product here eta1 squared, eta2 squared, eta3 squared times u1 squared, u2 squared, u3 squared. Yeah, this product. So this, this is the condition for a line to be invariant. And this part here is simply this part. Yeah, do you see that? Okay. So for this line to be invariant, it must be the case that u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u3 squared equals that. What is this equal to? Yeah, its value, uh, one. one, okay, from Pythagoras, because u is a unit vector. And we know in this that u1 is equal to minus u3, yeah? So we can solve this equation, because we know eta1, eta2, and eta3. And you will get two solutions to that equation. Uh, this is a possible invariant line, and this is a possible invariant line. Now, do you know why we get two solutions? Yes. Yeah? It's one way to here, another way to Yeah, because you can rotate this way or this way, the ellipsoid. Yeah? So we've obtained two solutions because, you know, here we have two undistorted lines, and I can rotate this way or this way. Okay? So there are two solutions to the invariant line. Similarly, when we will do the invariant normal, you will find there are two solutions to the invariant normal. So you can combine the invariant line and invariant normal in four ways. So we will get four solutions for the total deformation which changes austenite into martensite. But because of our cubic symmetry, they're all equivalent, right? However, if we are dealing with a lower symmetry system, then you will actually find it possible to get martensite forming on different habit planes in the same, with the same structures. Okay? So we have two solutions here. And notice that uh, uh, this is equal to minus this. Okay? Because we've chosen the plane of the lattice invariant here to be 101 F. So this must lie in that plane. Right, now um, we look for the invariant normal. And again, we have this system here. And this direction, which is the displacement direction of the lattice invariant deformation, must lie in this plane. Uh, again, again, looking at that. And we write uh, the invariant normal in the reciprocal basis as H1, H2, H3, and it's of magnitude 1. It's a unit vector. And for this direction to lie in this plane, h1 must be equal to h3, okay? Just as we did it did for the invariant line. 
So it's a unit vector, and H1 must be equal to H3, given our system of lattice invariant deformation. When we deform a H using the Bain strain, it will transform into another normal, L, okay, whose magnitude is the, given by this equation here. And I then substitute uh, for L in terms of H and the Bain strain. Now, you might ask why this is the inverse, right? And it's transpose of the inverse. Any ideas? You know, when, when I wanted to say that um, <coughs> we um, That's how uh, a direction is deformed by the Bain strain. To give a uh, vector u changes into a vector v, right? Now, how is a plane normal deformed by the same deformation? Okay. So let, let's just try and derive that. So supposing that a vector u lies in a plane h. Right? Then what's h dot u? Is zero, isn't it? Okay. So I'm going to write uh, write this out in full. So we've got okay. that's when uh, the vector h lies in the plane u. I'll go into this board because it's longer. Okay. So what I, what I want to do is, uh, if I have a plane and a vector in a plane, and I apply homogeneous deformation, then that vector will still remain in that plane, right? The plane will be deformed and the vector will be deformed, but that vector still remains in the plane because we have a homogeneous deformation, right? So you will become the vector v after deformation, and h will become the plane normal k after deformation. And h dot u is equal to k dot v, right? Yep. So we've got And I'm going to dot both sides with H, or, or rather K, because this is a V. See that? Because it's H. No, that's not right. Yeah, because this is this is the vector v dotted with k is equal to k dotted with v on the other side. Now, how do I introduce H into this? Hmm. 
this this um, but I want to I want to prove it. You're you're right. Yeah? How do I prove it? That's the property of a homogeneous deformation. So I replace this here by this. Yeah. H dot u is equal to k dot v. Yeah. We've, we've demonstrated that. So if I replace this, I get h f star into f u is equal to k f star f b f into f u, right? So what I've done is I've replaced this part here by this part, OK? Now can you see that if I cancel out this, then I get h is equal to k times f b f, yeah? OK, and therefore k is equal to if I multiply by the inverse of FBF on both sides, then H F star into FBF to the minus 1. Okay. So the initial unit normal H is deformed into K by the inverse of the Bain strain. Is everybody convinced by that? I struggled myself, but we've got to the right answer. That this one is uh, is clear. That k times f into v is equal to k times b u. Yeah. And this is simply because of the property of a homogeneous deformation that h dot u must be equal to k dot v, right? So if I substitute for k v into this equation, then I get h dot u is equal to kb into u. Cancel out u on both sides and rearrange the equation. Then in order to deform the unit normal h, I have to multiply it by the inverse of the Bain strain. Okay. I'm glad I was here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Isn't F star B F star? No, no. Uh, it's a, it's a deformation. It's an autonormal system we are dealing with. Yeah. Okay. You know, in autonormal system, all the vectors are unit vectors, and a one star is parallel to a one, and also has magnitude one. Yeah. Okay. Everybody happy with that? OK. Right, so we have, um, we have the same sort of procedure as before, that look, uh, h is deformed into L. And this is the magnitude of L. And we can express L f star as h f star into f b f to the minus 1, and the transpose of the inverse. And therefore, we end up with this equation, that this is equal to this. And we get two solutions for the invariant normal. Okay. And notice that uh, if I dot this with 1, 0, bar 1, okay, then I get 0 again. Okay. So we have two solutions for the invariant line and two solutions for the invariant normal. And in principle, we have four. But in the case of this particular example, which is for cubic systems, you will have four crystallographically equivalent uh, solutions. So let's pick one invariant normal and one invariant line from there. And I've chosen to pick this particular invariant normal and this particular invariant line. If I take the cross product of u and h, I get another vector, and similarly another vector b here. 
Uh, this is uh, H is before deformation, L is after deformation, U is before deformation, X is after deformation, and A is before deformation, and B is after deformation. So this, this is simply taking cross products between X and L and U and H, because I want three sets of vectors from each, before and after deformation. And you can see where I'm going. You know, when we, we were trying to write down a deformation matrix, we said it will consist of columns, you know, which are before and after deformation, right? So I've got three sets of vectors. H becomes L, U becomes X, and A becomes B. Okay? Here, here are the equations. Um, this is the rigid body rotation that we are talking about. So when we write these equations in matrix form, here we are. Okay? So this is U, H, A, and um, this should be X here, okay? X, L, and B. And then it's simple to derive that rigid body rotation by multiplying both sides by the inverse uh, of this matrix, and we get this as our rigid body rotation to produce the invariant line from the Bain strain. Now, notice here that this is almost 1, this is almost 1, and this is almost 1. So this is a very small rotation from the Bain strain. Okay? The, the other, other components are close to zero. So this is a rigid body rotation, and we can find the rotation axis and the rotation angle. Uh, I haven't got it on here, but it, it's easy to find the rotation axis and rotation angle given the uh, amount of rotation. So if you have that, you can now predict the orientation exactly. Because we know the Bain orientation, and we are just adding a little bit more. So we'll do that in the next lecture, and also complete the theory totally. Now, the most important thing is that you understand the concept which was introduced in the first half, because the rest of it is just mathematics. OK? It's important mathematics if you want to do a calculation of texture, for example. But nevertheless, the concept is more important. And in the book, there are worked examples, which basically are the ones that I've been showing you on the board. So you can follow them carefully. OK? OK.